I called when I went for for Red Sox. I called everybody on the roster, everybody in the major league roster, and I got Josh Beckett on the line. And I'm in actually in the security line, going to get on a flight. And Josh Beckett gives me. He's like, he goes, I don't know you. He said, I like the other guy. He said, there's a real good chance when I get to training camp that I won't even talk to you. And I was like, oh, really nice to meet you too, Josh. I've seen a couple of weeks, you know, <laughs> and I hung up and I called my wife and I was like, I was like, oh shit, Josh Beckett just gave me an earful. And, uh, and we got to be buddies. Like we laughed. We had so much fun when I was at the Red Sox with him. I loved the guy, but he was one of those guys, Texan, very much self-made, you know, never gone to college, was throwing a hundred in high school kind of guy. And he just was like, he used to always look at me like, Mike, I'm really good at this and I'm fucking rich. And <laughs> I was, and he goes, and I was really good at it and really rich before I met you. And I would kind of be like, you know something, Josh, you're right. You were really good at this. You were like the guy, you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you were throwing a hundred miles an hour and you make millions of dollars and you don't need me. But I might help you make a couple million more and he'd kind of laugh like he used to give me a hard time because when I worked for the Red Sox, my kids were young and I had arranged to go home on the weekends. And no one, if you've ever worked in pro baseball, pro baseball is like going to Devil's Island. When you show up at training camp, you are now on Devil's Island for the duration with the group and you, no one leaves, like no one gets out alive kind of thing. And suddenly I'm going home every weekend. And about the third weekend, he pulls me aside. He's like, who's your agent? I said, I don't have an agent. Why? He said, you got a really good deal. He said, you leave every Friday, you come back every Monday. He said, nobody here leaves every Friday and comes back every Monday. How did you get that deal? And I looked at him. I said, well, actually, I asked for your deal. I said, I asked for the deal where I worked every fifth day. And they wouldn't give me that. But they did give me weekends <laughs> off. And he just looked at me. And he was like, well played. And after that, <laughs> it was like, it was uphill from there. You know what I mean? We were just, but it's, it's the ability like to not take yourself too seriously. And I've seen guys get fired because, especially in our field, our field is filled. I, I've got to, I, I hope you're, uh, I hope you have an open-minded uh, audience, but our field is filled with like hardos and dicks. Like it's just, there are so many narcissists who just think they're the coolest person on the planet that they're, they're not going to succeed probably in college or in professional sports in reality, because they can't get over themselves. And, I mean, I'm the opposite. I'm like, I, when I was at the Red Sox, I'm like a, I'm a 52 year old in pretty average physical condition looking guy who's suddenly showing up here and saying, yeah, I'm, we're going to do a lot of things differently. So you got to be willing to, I guess, to sell a different way. Pros, pros is selling training, whether you like it or not, no matter how much support you get, you got to really sell your good guys to, to get it going. And what I did, I was, Again, I think I'm, I do think I'm reasonably intelligent. I got there. The first thing I did is I tossed myself into the injured guys. And at that time, when I got there, we had 11 guys, 11 post-surgical guys on the disabled list coming into spring training, which was a, a significant number. And I started doing one-on-one -on -one strength and conditioning with every single guy that was on the disabled list, figuring out, okay, we're going to work around your injury. We're going to figure out a way, you know, if you had, we had a couple of UCL guys, uh, John Lackey had a UCLA, Dice came out, uh, Dice came out to Zucker, had a UCL. So we're getting them, you know, training their other side and training their legs and figuring core exercises they can do without having to use their arm. And I'm just working my way through all these guys to the point where I had guys on the major league roster coming and saying, when are you going to make time for me? And I thought, I always tell everybody it's the, uh, Andrew Cleese and the lion story. So if you're, uh, an Aesop's fable guy. Andrew Cleese ends up in a cave with, unfortunately, he's an escaped slave. He hides in a cave and he can hear all kinds of crying in the cave, wailing. And he knows it's an ant, it's a herd animal. But he's like, I got to hide in the cave. Otherwise, they're going to send me back. And when he gets to the back of the cave, he sees a lion sitting there just moaning and holding on to its paw. And he kind of looks over and he realizes the lion's got a huge thorn in its paw. And he kind of creepy crawls over towards the lion and he reaches in and he pulls the thorn out and the lion is like licking him and hugging him and is his best friend. And the lion starts going out and it, you know, it kills food and brings food back into the cave for him. But eventually Andrew Cleese gets caught again. And obviously in ancient Rome, 
what do they do with you when they want to kill you? They throw you to the lions, right? So Androcles is gets sentenced to be thrown to the lions. And he's in the middle of the Colosseum and the Empress sitting up there in his chair and they pull the gate up and the lion comes roaring out and hugs Androcles and starts licking his face. And the emperor can't believe, he's like, you know, what's going on? And he obviously he pardons Androcles because somehow he has magical control of lions. But it was his lion. It was the one from the cave that they had used. You know, and I tell people all the time, like, know who the fucking lions are. Okay? <laughs> You know, when you're in that sports world, understand who the Lions are. And when you can do that, that's like like with Cam Neely. I started taking care of him. He was hurt. Nobody's taking care of him. I just pick him up. He's my personal project. All of a sudden, he's healthy and he's playing. And he's back to being the man. And suddenly, I am the man. Because and he literally, he was the most loyal guy ever in pro sports. He was like, because everybody wanted to interview him because he's having this unbelievable comeback. And he's like, I'm not doing one interview that you're not there. So I was, I had a friend one time call me and say, I just saw you on Czech sport. I'm in Czechoslovakia. I have no idea what it was about, but it was you and this big guy with the medicine ball. And I was like, yeah, that was the Cam Neely rehab story in Czechoslovakia. They must've picked it up off of ESPN or something. But I was everywhere because his way of saying thank you was, I'm not, no one's going to talk to me about my rehab or my comeback without talking to you also. So, I mean, people still laugh. I'm still on New England Sports Network probably once a week doing workouts with Cam Neely. It still shows up in like the documentary about him. But it was a matter of, and at that time I didn't, I just knew, you know, here's a project. Here's a guy who maybe if I can help him, it'll be a good thing. I didn't have any conception in my mind how good a thing it was going to be, that it was going to be kind of a career making moment for me. But it was. I mean, that kind of speaks to probably the most difficult transition that strength coaches have is that's, and, and now it seems potentially more readily accessible, whether that's true or not, is the transition into the private sector from pros. Right? People get, you know, they get a Div 2 job, they get a JUCO job, they get a Div 1 job, they get a pro job. But, you know, there's freedom and there's lifestyle, and there's opportunity. Like, you know, you're not checking into Devil's Island when you're on your own thing. When did like that exposure. <laughs> When did that realization of the demand outside of the confines of a team, when did it dawn on you that like, hey, I'm going to move into the private sector. I'm going to step away from pro sports. And what was that transition like? Well, it was interesting because it was much sort of, you know, they, what do they say? Necessity is the mother of invention, right? So right. Um, I was making probably $20,000 a year at BU. And I had this idea that I was going to train professional hockey players in the summer just to make a little bit of extra money. And I happened to sit, we, that year, we went to the final four for the first time. And this is how you talk about people. So we go to the final four for the first time. Our captain is Mike Sullivan, who's now the Penguins coach, who's won whatever, three Stanley Cups. But we go to the final four for the first time, maybe since the 70s. I'm not sure exactly, but it had been a long time. And there's an agent, a guy named Bob Murray, who's on the flight and he's behind me. And I tell him that I want to, I want to maybe train some AHL guys. And he kind of looked at me. I said, yeah, I just want, I said, I think what we're doing is working. I don't think NHL guys will listen to me. Do you have some AHL guys who you think have the capacity to make NHL teams? And he was like, oh, I got a bunch. So he sent me like eight guys. And interesting, like talk about general managers. One of them is Tommy Fitzgerald, who's now the general manager of the Devils. But Fitzy was one of my first clients at that time. He had just, he had left school early and was an Islanders draft pick and hadn't made it right out of, you know, right out of, I think he went one year at Providence and then was trying to make it in the minors. And uh, Ken Hodge Jr., who ended up making the Bruins that year, another kid named Jeff Lazaro, who ended up making the Bruins last year. These were all people that guys sent me who hadn't made it yet in the NHL. And I think that summer, if we had eight guys, I think four made NHL teams. And we went... The next year, we went to another Final Four in 91. We went to the Final Four nine out of 10 years in the 2000s decade. So we had a pretty good run during that uh, decade. We won two national championships during that time. Um, and uh, no, actually, we won one. We went 95, and we, I think we played in four championship games in the 90s. But I just started training these pro guys, and all of a sudden, I made an extra, whatever, say I made an extra eight grand. But on top of it, $20,000 salary. 
that was a that was a pretty big raise. I mean, I I almost increased my earnings by like fifty percent during the course of ten weeks or twelve weeks in the summer. And I had also now parents were calling me about kids, and I thought oh, I don't want to do that. But I looked at the extra eight grand I made and thought, geez, if I take another group of kids, maybe I can make another eight grand, and then that'll be sixteen grand, and then I'll have almost doubled my twenty thousand dollars salary. So the next summer I took probably twelve pro guys and eight or 10 high school kids. And again, those kids all did well and those pro guys all did well. And over the course of that kind of 90s time period, I ended up at some point, I had about 120 kids training in the summer. <laughs> and I had, I mean, Chris Drury, general manager of the New York Rangers. I don't make these stories up. He worked for me in the summer training kids. So some kids can say, yep, Chris Drury was my trainer when, uh, when we were doing summer camp at BU. But, um, I was just hiring a bunch of the football players and hockey players, kids that I thought were responsible enough that they could kind of run a group, take them outside, put them through the warm up, bring them into the weight room. And that became Mike Boyle strength and conditioning. We got to about 120 kids. And I thought this isn't sustainable inside the university setting. So I, I kind of took the jump out in 98, I think either 97 or 98. I said, let's go in the, out into, private business, but I didn't leave BU. I stayed, I kept doing hockey from 97 until 2012. So I would bounce back and forth. I'd go back every day for workouts, practices, games, things at BU. 